Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me here tonight. I am, uh, as, as Skip said, I'm going to talk about the folks I've nominally called the, the last Republicans, Bush 41 and 43, our 41st and 43rd presidents. But before I do that, I'm going to just say a couple things about two other presidents. One, Bush, uh, one the, the 42nd president, the other the 36th president. Uh, 42nd president, of course, Bill Clinton. And uh, I have enormous respect for, for Bill Clinton. And one of the reasons I have respect for President Clinton is because of the people he brought around him. And uh, several of them are friends and are here tonight. I just want to recognize them. One is Skip Rutherford, my old friend, and uh, Nikolai De Papa, uh, Mike Hemphill, who does a marvelous job with the curriculum on the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program that Skip just mentioned, and Stephanie Street, who runs the Clinton Foundation, as well as Terry Garner, who is uh, my, my former colleague uh, when I was the director of the LBJ Presidential Library. And I will tell you that there is, uh, there is simply not a better presidential library director in the system than Terry Garner. So I am, uh, I'm delighted to be here in the house of the 42nd president among friends. So thank you so much for having me. Now to the 36th president, um, Lyndon Johnson, whom I've been around for about a decade now between being the director of the LBJ Presidential Library and the present CEO of the LBJ Foundation now. There are wonderful stories about this outsized personality, Lyndon Johnson. One, one of my favorites is, goes back to his Senate days. LBJ, before he became vice president and then president, was, of course, in the Senate. Uh, he was the uh, minority whip and then became uh, majority leader, or minority leader before becoming the, probably the most powerful majority leader of the 20th century. And he was about to go back to Texas to run for re-election and had a couple of his speechwriters draft a, a stump speech that he would use in the campaign. And so his, his uh, speechwriters draft a speech and they bring it to him and he starts reading it and uh, he comes across a passage from Plato, Greek philosopher, Plato, and he says, Plato? Plato? He said, let me get this straight. I'm going back to Texas, to just talk to plain folks and you have me quoting Plato? He said, keep the passage, but start it with, my daddy always used to say. <laughs> when George W. Bush was president, I heard a lot of people talk about his what his daddy was saying to him about the role of president. We've only had two pairs of father-son presence in the history of our country. The first pair was the Adams. John Adams, who was followed into office 24 years later by his son, John Quincy Adams, his namesake. And uh, so a generation had elapsed between the presidencies of those two men. And John Adams was uh, a toothless octogenarian in the last 15 months of his life when his son took the presidency. He would die just shortly into his, his son's one-term presidency. And he was away in Quincy, Massachusetts, not a, in a position to help his son in any immediate way while he was stewarding the presidency. The Bushes were, it's a very different circumstances. Uh, the, the, the Bushes were president eight years apart. Bill Clinton, of course, spanned the distance between. George H.W. Bush left the office in 1993, relinquishing it to Bill Clinton, and George W. Bush took it up in 2001, succeeding Bill Clinton. So the elder Bush, George H.W., was just 76 years old, a very spry 76, when his son took office. So he was in a position to be of immediate benefit to his son. And so that's a story that needed to be told. And it needed to be told from the principles themselves. It's not a story that you can tell in retrospect. It's because the Bushes are so famously circumspect, because they don't talk, they don't wallow on the couch, they don't express their feelings readily. It's a story that you had to get directly from them. And so I, I talked to, I got to know George H.W. Bush through the years, and, and he is an, an incredibly gracious man. And so I went down to Houston to talk to him about the possibility of doing this book. And he's, at, at this point, he's very taciturn. He uh, doesn't say a whole lot, but he said, I'll do it if W does. And I think he said that thinking there wasn't a chance in hell 
that George W. Bush was going to do this, this book. So, uh, but George W. Bush took the meeting. I went up to Dallas to see him. And uh, has, has anyone, does anyone here know George W. Bush? Have you, has anyone spent time with him? I know Stephanie has. No, Steph in fact, I was just here recently where he gave Stephanie a big bear hug. And, uh, but he is uh, a, a very, he's a very funny guy. I went to see him in Dallas. He had his feet up on the desk. He was fingering this lit cigar. And I, I'm, I'm there ready to make this sales pitch for history. Here's why you need to do this book. Someone's going to do it, whether, whether you want them to or not. And so you might as well talk to the person who's doing it. Before I could even spit out those words, he said, um, I think this book has to be done, and I think you're the guy to do it. And I was so unprepared for a yes that I didn't have a recording device. He started going right into the story of him and his dad. We had a series of interviews. Unfortunately, I was prepared in those subsequent outings, but I can tell you that I left that meeting, I tore down to the garage, and I started writing feverishly the stuff that I had just heard. Uh, because again, I didn't have a recording device. But there's a great story about the two of them, two stories, actually. And it shows you how intertwined their presidencies were. First story happens in 1990. Uh, the, the Bush family gathers at Camp David, as they did uh, all of the years of the George H.W. Bush presidency. And, uh, but at this, and George H.W. Bush is always better when his family is around. He told me a number of times, I never felt that this is the loneliest job in the world thing, because I had my family with me to make the journey with me, to comfort me. To, to, to express their love for me in a job that frankly isn't very loving at times. So he was always different, more relaxed, uh, more comfortable when his family was around. So, but, but this particular Christmas, 1990, he had a lot on his mind. We had launched uh, in the Gulf Operation Desert Shield. And we were about to launch Operation Desert Storm, which meant introducing ground troops into Kuwait to to uh, drive out the Iraqis who had invaded Kuwait. And that night, he goes to one night he goes to bed and he wakes up with a, the remnants of a dream in his head. Um, again, he has an extraordinarily big decision to make here. And the dream is that he finds out while on a golf outing, the bushes are the quintessential golf, uh, the uh, uh, wasps rather, so naturally it's a golf outing. And, um, he hears that his father, who, was dead, who had died in 1972, is once again alive. And he finds out that he's in a hotel not far away. And he drives to the hotel as quickly as he can, goes up to his father's room, he thrusts open the door, and there is his dad, in his words, big, strong, highly respected. And he throws his arms around him and says, I miss you very much. Flash forward. 12 years to 2002, when the Bush family is once again gathered at Camp David, improbably. They're once again there around the presidency of George W. Bush. And George W. Bush has a big decision to make, whether to march into Baghdad and take out Saddam Hussein and start the business of nation building in Iraq. But his father is there, big, strong, highly respected. And it's the one and only time that George W. Bush seeks his father's counsel on the war in Iraq. He says, Dad, you know, what should I do here? And he, said, he says, son, you know how tough war is, but if the man won't comply, by which he means to UN sanctions, to the UN inspectors going into Iraq to ensure that he is not making weapons of mass destruction, you have no choice. Again, it's the only time that his father uh, offers advice. It's the only time it's solicited on the war, uh, on the, the issue of Iraq during the course of his presidency. So that in itself is fascinating. One quick story before I throw it up to questions. Again, there was great speculation about what would transpire between these two because they both had been president and, and they, they both took such a different road in Iraq from one another. Their policies uh, varied so much. And there's a story, I heard there's a wonderful story about a, um, 
a secretary in the White House receiving a fax from George H.W. Bush. And so she, she takes it, she stuffs it into a, a, an envelope and she urgently takes it into the Oval Office uh, so that George W. Bush can read it. And George W. Bush takes it, takes that, and it reads something like this. Guy goes into a courtroom for having stolen a can of peaches. Guy, this guy and his wife, and he's, he's before the judge. And the judge says, uh, so how many peaches were in that uh, can that you, you stole? The guy says, about six peaches. And the judge says, okay, you have uh, six days in jail. And with that, the guy's wife jumps up and said, he stole a can of peas too. <laughs> Again, there was this great spec. The, 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 the elder Bush played a vitally important role in some respects, but it's not the role that people think it was. What George H.W. Bush was doing in sending that fax was helping his son to relax, to show them that he was loved, to show them that he was being thought of. And because he himself had been president, he knew his son didn't need one other person telling him what to do. And it reflects the humility and the compassion of George H.W. Bush. Uh, with that, I, I would be happy to take questions uh, about the book and, and to talk about it or anything else that is, is on your mind. All right. Now you've got one of America's best here. So, uh, and you can, any question you want, even including Texas politics, if you want to ask about it. <laughs> All right, come on, hands. Yes, sir. No, wait, we'll get the microphone to you. Yeah. Sir, how did you arrive at the decision to title it The Last Republicans? The, the Last Republicans was a, a title that I had come up with in 2016. And uh, it was clear whether Hillary Clinton won the presidency or Donald Trump that it was the last of a, of, of a kind of republicanism. The establishment republicanism of a bygone era was going away. And I thought of this, I shopped it to Harper, my publisher. They didn't like the title at all. I was stuck on it and I was gonna stick by it regardless uh, of, of how they felt, but we were really digging in on this. And then George W. Bush was have alleged to have said at the, at the George W. Bush Library when convening a number of former aides, I may be the last Republican president, which I had heard rumor of. And then the next time I went up to see him, he said the same thing to me. I, went, I lamented the fact that he had said it because I thought, well, now I can't call the, the book The Last Republicans. And my wife said, no, no, no. The, the, the title's just been sanctioned. It's all the more reason to call it The Last Republicans. And I, I think it, it fits. It was a little controversial at the time, but one of the things that the book does is reveal the feelings of the Bush, Bush's elder and younger around Donald Trump. And you can see that there is clearly a difference in, in terms of the way they see the presidency and in terms of the way they see uh, politics and policy for that matter. Questions? Yes, sir. Got, come, the microphone's coming right at you. Was there anything in the in their discussions about? I mean, the Bush uh, H W was famous as far as the "Read My Lips" uh, tax increase that they passed, but then W went the exact opposite direction with the tax cuts. Was there any discussion between them as far as the economics that were involved in all this? N no, I don't, I'm not aware of any discussions between the two of them about uh, their, their different economic policies. George H.W. Bush was compelled to capitulate on the, the, the tax increases of 1990 in order to get a budget deal closed. Uh, he did so somewhat reluctantly having made that now infamous promise read my lips, no new taxes. Uh, and, uh, and he does so at his political peril, but he doesn't see a way around it. And I think he sees ultimately it'll, it'll do the economy good. And if you talk to economists today, they will tell you that that tax cut helped to pave the way for the unprecedented prosperity that we saw during the Clinton administration. And the John F. Kennedy Library awarded uh, George H. W. Bush its Profiles in Courage Award for making that decision. It probably cost him the presidency. 
almost certainly did. And George W. Bush is a more canny politician than his father is. I think his father would concede that. Um, I think it's interesting, we talk a lot about the, the relationship uh, between Bush 41 and Clinton, which is a really wonderful story, which I'd be happy to talk about. But there's also an enormously close relationship between Bill Clinton and, and Bush 43. And one of the things I think they see eye to eye, one of the reasons I think they get along so well, rather, is because they are both incredibly astute politicians. And the old man doesn't quite have that same political instinct. So George W. Bush was not going to make the mistake of his father. I think he was also very wary of the fact that his father didn't seize the opportunity to exploit political capital when he had it. When he had won the Gulf War, uh, won the Gulf War triumphantly, after this really driving away the stigma of Vietnam to a large extent, and when he had ended the peace, the, 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 uh, the, the Cold War rather peacefully, I think he had a great opportunity to use that political capital to do something domestically, and he failed to do so. George W. Bush uh, did not squander political capital. He used capital very, I think, strategically in order to uh, launch the Gulf War, and we can, we can argue about the wisdom of that decision but he put the weight that he had around that decision and we ended up going forward. So I think uh, while they probably did not have a discussion about the, that ill-fated pledge, uh, broken pledge to not uh, instill any, any taxes, um, he was aware of the lesson that his father provided around that. Yeah, Chris, hold on just a minute. Do the Bushes reflect on the uh, impact of their combined efforts in the Middle East, and how do they how do they look back on uh, the long-term effects or results of the decisions they made? The, the question is, yeah, I think you all heard that, but but how do they reflect? How do the Bushes reflect on the decisions they made around Middle East policy? I think George H. W. Bush he, he's extraordinarily humble. Actually, let me, let me tell you a story about his humility and I'll, I'll answer your question. This, uh, it's one of the hallmarks of the, 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 the character of the Bush family, humility. Uh, and George H.W. Bush tells a wonderful story about um, going to this conference in Prague after the Cold War had ended. And there was this great hall that convened some of the great Cold Warriors of the latter part of the struggle of the Cold War. And, and in that hall, you had Margaret Thatcher and Helmut Kohl and Vaclav Havel and, and others, really pretty much the only major person uh, uh, who, who uh, helped to wage the Cold War, uh, who wasn't there was Ronald Reagan, who was ailing from Alzheimer's and, and was at home. And, and as George H.W. Bush tells it, Margaret Thatcher made the first speech and she got up and it, it, George H.W. Bush does a very bad imitation of, of Margaret Thatcher saying, let me be clear from the outset, Ronald Reagan and I won the Cold War. And Bush looks around this hall and he sees these people, many of whom had put their lives on the line to, uh, uh, to see liberation in their country, to see freedom come and uh, to, to get rid of uh, uh, you know, communism. And he's just stewing. And as he is, just it, it's so angered about this. Helmut Kohl sends a message to him, sort of junior high school style. George Bush opens it and uh, written in English are the words, is this woman nuts? <laughs> uh, and, and George W. Bush will say that humility is the most important leadership trait because you need to know what you don't know and you need to concede that and bring around you people who have that knowledge and have confidence that you can derive that from them and make the right decision. But in terms of their Middle East, policy, um, I think George H.W. Bush is very proud of having waged the Gulf War, not only for, uh, for humanitarian reasons, but for economic reasons. Uh, uh, Kuwait is a very important uh, economic partner to the United States. Oil is obviously an extraordinarily important commodity. Um, but I think he was particularly compelled to do so for humanitarian reasons. And so I think he would be, uh, he would put that on the first one or two things that he's most proud of. Uh, George W. Bush has seen the controversy that has come from waging the Gulf War, or excuse me, the, the, the war in Iraq. Um, and I think that uh, he would tell you 
that it was the right thing to do. I think he still firmly believes that it was the right thing to do. And he further believes that had uh, we continued to, to uh, make a commitment to the democratization of Iraq, that it would have had a transformational effect on the Middle East. I think that's why he did it. There was a great deal of speculation about why we went to Iraq. Was it to avenge his dad's, uh, the assassination attempt that Saddam Hussein had made on his father when George H.W. Bush was a former president? Was it about oil? Was it, there were so many things. We had there were all these machinations that we thought might be transpiring between the, the Bushes around Iraq and why, why George W. Bush would, would wage the war. But I think at the end of the day, it was, it was this notion, this very big idea, that if you introduce democracy into that region, it will become viral. And that once people get a taste of freedom, uh, you will see economic development and you will see neighbors get al getting along better with neighbors. I think that was the idea. Uh, George W. Bush would also say that he believes that it resulted in Arab Spring, and we never s quite saw Arab Spring catch fire. Uh, so we will, we'll never know what might have happened had we continued George W. Bush's policy, but I don't think he's particularly contrite about why we went to, to war in Iraq. Anything else? Yes, sir. Yeah, we'll get the microphone. He, he's coming with the microphone to you. I'll get you, Carney. It's a major task to write uh, a book about a single president, and you have a father-son uh, with only eight years separating. Were there any unique challenges you had in writing this book? Oh, there were many. Um, and you're right, it's a daunting task. You know, you're not only, it, it, on, on the one hand, it's a dual biography, and on the other hand, it's, it's a story of the relationship of these two men. Um, yeah, I think the, the challenge was getting, getting them to open up about their relationship, and I was, I was pleased that they ultimately did. Uh, again, they're, they're, they're famously circumspect. They're not particularly reflective. These are not people who, uh, who talk readily about their feelings, but, um, but I, I think I, I ultimately, I hope I got the story. I, again, because I think it's so important to, to tell. We may w well never have another father-son president. We may never have a mother-son or, or uh, you know, father-daughter uh, uh, presidential duo in, in the history of this nation. So it, it was a story that had to be told. And I was, you know, I, I got, to, got to know the Bushes relatively well. And I, I'd like to believe that I engendered their trust and they were willing to tell me things. Um, but but what, it's interesting, one of the things I asked the elder Bush, and this was a really tough question, is the question that's on everyone's mind. What would you have done had you been in your son's position? Um, would you have gone to war in Iraq? I remember asking this question, it was, uh, we were in Kenny Bunkport, Maine, and uh, Bush has a very small office there, very spare and small office. It was during the summer of uh, 2015. And, uh, and we were sitting really close together because he, he couldn't hear very well. And in fact, our legs were touching. And, uh, and I asked him, what would you have done? Would you have done what your son did in Iraq? Would you have gone and taken out Saddam Hussein? Would you have uh, uh, made that fight? And he said, it's hard to tell, this is a direct quote, he said, it's hard to tell, but yeah, I think so. And at that moment, it was difficult to know whether that was the answer of a former commander in chief, putting himself in his successor's shoes, or the answer of a father trying to protect his son's legacy. And I can tell you, knowing the Bushes as I do, I think it was probably the latter. But he would concede that the world had changed when his son became uh, president. And that's why he didn't proffer advice more readily. Again, there was, there was the humility, there was understanding the burdens of the office and not wanting to be another burden for his son. And there was the fact that the world it was very different after 9-11. And there were a lot of things that he wasn't privy to that he knew his son was. And he, what he m was most concerned about was not that his son was making the right decisions, but rather that his son was surrounding himself with people who would steer him in the right direction, who would give him good advice. And that's an important challenge for any president. I'm looking at Stephanie Street, who was in the White House. And you know how vitally important that is.
you got to have people around you who are going to who are going to lead you on the right course who are going to give you the right information so that you make you have you make the right decisions and that's a challenge there's a challenge for uh lyndon johnson i can tell you and it was certainly a challenge for george george w bush this is not a question it's uh when george uh, uh the elder bush spoke at harding university uh here in uh, arkansas uh, after he made his speech uh he opened the uh, you know he asked for questions and among the questions he had a eight-year-old girl in the balcony who asked if she if she if he could give her a hug and of course he said yes and she went down and it was a very tender moment but it really painted a picture for me of of uh, his humility and his humanity yeah yeah uh, jim baker said that uh you know george hw bush could dry, could, could could cry at the drop of a hat he's a very emotional guy it's something that we didn't see uh, in, his, uh, in his presidency very often. In fact, one of the, the most important moments of his presidency came when the Berlin Wall fell. And, uh, and the reporters were gathered in the Oval Office. And George H.W. Bush received that news very dispassionately. It was not a triumphant spike the football moment for George Herbert Walker Bush. And Leslie Stahl said, this is an amazing development. We've been waiting for this for years. Why aren't you more excited? And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm just not a very emotional guy. Well, that's, that's, that's not true at all. But the reason that he didn't want to make an emotional response around it is he didn't want to compromise leadership in the Soviet Union and in the Eastern Bloc nations that would lead to greater reform. He didn't want the hardliners to be emboldened uh, he, he, he didn't want uh, the world to think that the Americans were gloating over this development. And that, that, um, that, that not only shows humility, that shows restraint. Uh, but uh, you know, not being emotional is, uh, is foreign to George H.W. Bush, as you saw with that little girl. Mark, can you talk a little bit or, or share your views on the relationship during the 41 and 43 administrations with Saudi Arabia, given the various conflicts and very difficult uh, issues that took place during those two uh, administrations, obviously with the Gulf War and 9-11, and then maybe comment a little bit today on the current relationship with Saudi Arabia, given the horrific murder of yeah. uh, Mr. Khashoggi. The, the Stephanie, the, the, uh, our relationship with, with Saudi Arabia was vitally important during the Gulf War. We needed to send military there so that we, as a staging area, in order to successfully launch the, uh, the Gulf War. Um, and the Operation Desert Storm, as I mentioned, you know, sending ground troops into to Kuwait. So that was, um, having that relationship was uh, was absolutely invaluable, and it speaks to the diplomatic skills of the elder Bush. He had extraordinarily close relationships with the leaders of uh, the Middle Eastern nations, Israel and the and the uh, the Arab states. Uh, of course, we know now that that's that that is what led to Osama bin Laden. Right? This is sacred ground. Islam, the, the, the most sacred ground in Islam is found in Saudi Arabia. That's where Mecca is located. And um, that was sacrosanct and uh, led to Osama bin Laden, which led to the, the biggest challenge of George W. Bush's presidency. George W. Bush had a slightly different view in the Middle East than his father. Uh, he embraced Israel. I think pleasing the, the conservative wing of his party. George W. Bush is, is instinctively more conservative than his, than his father. He's also, uh, as I mentioned before, probably a better politician, and he knew how to toe the conservative line. And one of the ways he did that successfully during his administration was by embracing Israel at the expense, to some degree, of the relationships that we had with the Middle Eastern nations. I think the, uh, if you look at Saudi Arabia today, there was great hope uh, when um, 
the crown prince w w w w was, was nicknamed MBS, Mohammed bin Salam, uh, became the leader in Saudi Arabia, or, or, Saudi Arabia excuse me. Um, among other things, he came to the United States earlier this year on what Time Magazine called a charm offensive. He met with leaders throughout uh, our, our nation to talk about the reforms that he would bring to Saudi Arabia. And of course, this is what we're waiting for um, because it could transform the is I Islamic faith to a certain degree and we could see fewer hardliners complicating things in the, in the Middle East. I think the, uh, the George W. Bush folks also talk about the, the importance of liberating women in that part of the world, how that can uh, lead to fundamental change in the region. So there was it's great hope that this guy was gonna change things, that he was gonna be a reformer. And at the same time, I, I, it's funny, John Brennan, uh, former CIA chief, was at the LBJ uh, library yesterday and I did an interview with him. And he said that uh, while we had that great hope, this guy is ultimately a thug, essentially. This guy is almost certainly responsible for the death of, of Jamal uh, Khashoggi. Um, and uh, it will probably lead to that, whether, um, whether that happens soon or not, I don't know, but I, I, I think it's almost, I'm, I'm, I'm using, uh, I'm gonna adopt uh, John Brennan's view, I think that's almost inevitable. And it's, and it's a missed opportunity, unfortunately. I think in the last year, Americans, regardless of their party affiliations, have become closer uh, to the Bushes because of people watching the funeral of, of, of Barbara Bush and seeing what the family went through. And one of the things that I heard people talking about was that she's a very opinionated woman. <laughs> uh, and I would be interested in knowing, just based on that, what type of input did she have in both administrations, both as a wife and as a mother? My wife's not here, so I thought that'd be a good question to, to raise. Um, I, can I, I talk about the uh, uh, the funeral for a second? She had a major hand in that funeral. I can tell you that. I was with the Bushes the week after Nancy Reagan had been buried. There was a very frosty relationship between Nancy Reagan and Barbara Bush. So the Bushes did not attend the funeral, nor did they watch the funeral on TV. Uh, but I was, I covered the funeral for, for ABC and had come back and, and uh, Barbara Bush said, uh, so tell me about the funeral. And, and I told her about it and she said, well, you know what, when I die, just make my funeral really quick. Um, and she, <laughs> one time I, was, I did a speech uh, in Kenny Bunkport, Maine, and the, the night before, we, my wife and I di had dinner with the Bushes. And she said, you know, George and I are, are coming to the speech tomorrow. And I said, yeah, I know, I'm, I'm honored. Thank you for, for doing that. And she said, so what's the format gonna be? And I said, well, I'll probably speak for about 40 minutes and then take 20 minutes worth of questions. And she said, Make it half an hour, no questions. <laughs> and I can say, as sure as I'm standing here, I spoke for 29 minutes. <laughs> so I was really relieved when that, when that funeral was short and to the point, and it was, very much at her direction. Um, I'm sorry, your question was about uh, Barbara Bush and the role in the family? Rather, you know, she's kind of matriarch, her role in both things. She, you know, she was called, is, by her family, the enforcer. And that's exactly what she was. Uh, I was saying earlier today that she was often the bad cop to George H. W. Bush's good cop. But one of the reasons that Barbara Bush is so important is because um, her husband was extraordinarily ambitious in business and in politics. And that meant spending a lot of time on the road, building his business and then building his political career. Many nights at home, leaving her with the responsibilities of the family and the household. And she was a full partner in her husband's career, in his professional life. And I don't think you would have George H.W. Bush but for Barbara Bush, making those sacrifices, which were to some degree generational. She was very much a product of her generation. In fact, almost controversially, when she was uh, first lady, she was speaking, I believe, at Smith uh, College, her, her alma mater, and there, was, there were some students who said she doesn't reflect the modern sensibility. We don't want her here. She doesn't have her own career. And she made this wonderful speech about viva la difference. 
You know, it's great that you are, are uh, forging your own lives. It's great that you're building your own careers. And it's great you're not subordinating your lives to a husband. But don't judge us who did. Times have changed, and that's a good thing. But don't look back and say that we did it wrong. Her son would say that um, he got his father's eyes and his mother's mouth. <laughs> he's, uh, he's very tart-tongued like his mother, shares her sense of humor. They're both quick with a quip, um, and they can both be blunt in a way that the old man isn't. Uh, but there's, there was obviously tremendous love there, and I think he, George, a, George W. Bush got as much from his mother uh, as he did from his father. Mark, what, in, in the book, what, what, what about Jeb? The, his role both with father and son and during the presidency, and obviously his unsuccessful run. So, so Jeb is, you know, there, there, there's a lot of conventional wisdom that has to be challenged in any uh, work of history. And, and, and it's, you really have something to sink your teeth into when there is huge conventional wisdom around something that can be debunked or dispelled. And, um, and the story, the, the, the narrative that you always hear about the Bush family is that it was, it was Jeb who was supposed to be the political heir apparent. How many, how many heard that about the Bush family, right? That was what, that, that was what, what you thought, and it, it made sense, right? Jeb was this very serious guy. Uh, he wanted to get into politics at a very early age. Um, he, was, he was smart, and you know, W was looked upon as kind of the ne'er-do-well, the iconoclast, the screw-up. And that's, that's largely overblown. I can tell you that what people forget is that George W. Bush waged a very um, impressive political campaign around a congressional seat in West Texas in 1978. It's funny because uh, that's when Bill Clinton was coming uh, up in the political ranks. And, um, and W won the, um, the, the Republican primary against all odds and then uh, 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 ran this very close race against a, an incredibly well-positioned Democratic opponent. In fact, there's a, there's, his opponent was this very crafty West Texan uh, who more or less outcountried W. And one of the ways he did it was by positioning uh, w as a carpetbagger, and he'd, he'd tell a joke. He'd say that, uh, you know, he said, the other day I was at my, uh, my daddy's farm, and uh, uh, I saw this BMW roll up, and, and the window came down, and the fella said, uh, say, can you tell me where the, the, the Johnson Ranch is? And the guy said, well, yeah, it's just right up the road a piece, you know, just go up a couple miles, and when you get to the cattle guard, take a right. The guy's about to drive off and he pauses. He says, so um, what color uniform will that cattle guard be wearing? <laughs> and he said, and when that BMW drove off, I saw Connecticut license plates. Because that's, of course, where George W. Bush was born. And the guy did. He, he outcountried him. But, but it was a very impressive race. Um, and so he, he, he showed his political chops relatively early. Jeb, though, um, also uh, very different from his brother, also had political ambitions. Again, he was the more serious one. I think it was a huge disappointment to George W. Bush and certainly to George H. W. Bush that he failed to get the Republican nomination, let alone the presidency. I think there were a lot of us who expected that Jeb Bush would be the nominee and that he would go up against Hillary Clinton for the presidency in 2016. I, I remember being in, at a meeting at ABC um, with George Stephanopoulos, and I was talking about why Jeb would win the nomination. You know, because it fits the pattern of Republicans not necessarily falling in love, but falling in line. Picking the candidate who was most viable, and at the time, if you're an establishment Republican, Jeb Bush was probably the most viable candidate you could, you could find. And, and Stephanopoulos, who has a great political mind, said, uh, it's different this time. It's different. And I began thinking about it, and sure enough, he was right. It was very different in 2016. And uh, timing is everything in politics. And it just wasn't Jeb Bush's time. We have time for one more? Yeah, if you don't, I've got one more I want to ask you. If somebody else doesn't have one, then we'll ask it. The Bush-Trump relationship been been fairly fractured clearly i think 
with the Barbara Bush funeral and all that. But in the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh for the Supreme Court, George W. Bush played a major role uh, in, in, and apparently was talking with Trump. What are they, is that relation, what, what, what insight do you have into that? And obviously Kavanaugh worked for Bush, but he did, he was on the phone with senators and you know, it was a quite controversial nomination whether you were for it or against it. Yeah, it's interesting, and that will probably be a story that will come out, Skip, um, after Donald Trump leaves office, and, and that is both of his uh, Supreme Court nominees were on George W. Bush's short list. Uh, Neil Gorsuch was on that list. Uh, both, both were on the Heritage Foundation's list, too, and I think they, they were both trying to toe the line of the, of the conservatives. They didn't want to alienate the conservative wings of their party. Uh, but, but moreover, George W. Bush, uh, aides to George W. Bush went to help those, uh, those nominees win their battles. Uh, so not only did, did uh, Donald Trump take his cues from George W. Bush in terms of who his nominees were, he also took uh, resources from George W. Bush in order to get them confirmed. There is, yeah, there is a very fractious relationship between all of our former presidents and Donald Trump. He is a true iconoclast, and um, the, the, the title of the book alludes to that, and one of the reasons that the, well, the, the sole reason that the Bush, uh, the, the, this, this book wound up on the front page of the, the New York Times uh, before it even broke was because they came out on the record for the first time about their feelings about, uh, about Donald Trump. And George W. Bush said, and again, looking back at humility, being the most important trait, he said that when Donald Trump said during the campaign of 2016, I am my, my own advisor, he thought, wow, this guy doesn't know what it means to be president. His father, uncharacteristically, was far more blunt. He said, I don't like him. I don't know him, but I don't like him. He's a blowhard. And he was pretty taciturn, that's, that's all he said, but Blowhard said everything. And there was a story that I, I learned in my research. Uh, interestingly enough, when uh, Bush was running for president, George H.W. Bush was running for president for the first time in 1988, Lee Atwater, his campaign deputy, came to him with this great suggestion uh, that he might want to put Donald Trump on the ticket as his vice president. Uh, and it wasn't because he necessarily came up with it himself, but because Atwater had received a call from Donald Trump saying, hey, you know, I'd be willing to be considered for vice president. Sounds a little like Donald Trump, doesn't it? George H.W. Bush immediately rejected it out of hand. Flash forward to his post-presidential years while Bill Clinton was in office, and um, George H.W. Bush is in an airport, I think it was at Logan Airport in the private terminal there. His plane it was having mechanical issues, and so he was in the waiting area of this very small private airport. And the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the person running the airport came to his chief of staff, Gene Becker, and said, we just learned that Donald Trump is about to land. Trump Air is about to, to land, and Donald Trump's going to be here. Does the former president want to say hello to him? So Gene Becker dutifully took this back, to Bush 41. Bush 41 at that point is reading the, uh, the Wall Street Journal and she whispers in, she, Donald Trump's about to be here. Do you want to say hello? He takes down the paper, he says, God, no. <laughs> and he lifts up the paper again and then he lifts it down and he goes, whoa, wait a minute, is he coming by here? And she says, I don't know. So to be on the safe side, he just put that newspaper up for the entire time <laughs> until uh, uh, the, 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 the party had walked through and he could go back on his airplane. Uh, you know, and it, and it makes sense, right? I mean, these are two fundamentally different people. Bush is a beacon of, of civility and humility. And uh, Donald Trump, whether you like him or not politically, uh, does not reflect those, those characteristics. Well, let's, uh, let's thank Mark for being here. Thank you here. very much. Thanks and so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.